So you are welcome to session eight, Observational Learning Part Two. We're going to continue with the discussions uh, we started from the previous session. Let's look at the overview. Right. So here we'll be focusing on the effects of observational learning on the learner and also look at uh, the application of observational learning in our everyday life situation. And then finally, we'll examine reinforcement and punishment from the point of view of observational um, learning. So as a result of this, we expect that you will be in the position after this session to demonstrate knowledge of uh, the effect of observational learning on the learner or the observer and then be also able to explain reinforcement and punishment in observational learning and be able to apply the understanding the concepts of observational learning in everyday uh, life situation. To help us do this, we have three main topics which reflect the objectives. The effects of observational learning on the learner Reinforcement and punishment in observational learning and the application of observational learning, observational learning in everyday situation. Right, you you can get other materials online on Sakai. That would be a uh, place there for you. So let's take the first topic: effects of observational learning on the learner. So we'll, we'll look at the various um, effects acquisition. Acquisition, uh, the first point you want to uh, consider. So observational learning helps the learner acquire new responses by observing the model. So that is the acquisition. It allows the learner to, after observing the model's behavior, be able to acquire new responses that maybe previously the person may not have uh, the capacity and also the skills to produce. There can also be inhibition. With this, we're referring to a response that otherwise may be made. And this is changed when the observer sees that the model is being punished. So there can be inhibition by the learner. Uh, inhibition in the learner's uh, maybe desire to observe and imitate the behavior of the model in the sense that if in the course of observation or observing the model, it came up that that behavior is punished, that behavior is being punished, then the observer will want to have a change of mind. So the punishment being meted out to the model as a result of the behavior will then inhibit the learning to exhibit that behavior in the observer. There is also this inhibition, in which case the observational learning may lead to reduction in fear in the observer. This is especially so if a model's behavior goes unpunished in the feared activity. For instance, the observer may fear a particular behavior or activity, may not want to engage in that behavior, or may not want to exhibit such a behavior. But if the observer realizes that, oh, this activity that I was even afraid of, that I fear all this while, see, someone did it, or someone was able to do it, and the person wasn't punished. So that fear is reduced in the person that the fear that initially the observer may be having towards that behavior is reduced. We call this situation this inhibition. We call it this inhibition. The next one is facilitation. Facilitation. So sometimes observing others serves to remind the learner or the observer of certain behaviors they already know and urges them on to exhibit the said behavior. 
For instance, a model elicits from an observer a response that has already been learned by the observer long ago, but the recent observation of the model's behavior is what facilitates or brings up that kind of uh, skills in that person to also want to exhibit it. So it facilitates the uh, learning in the learner or the observer. Then we have creativity as one of the uh, effects. So sometimes an observer will observe several models perform. And then based on these different ways and approaches of behaving, the learner may adapt the combination of characteristics and styles in a creative way. So we call it creativity in observational learning. So with that said, let's move on to topic two. Topic two, which uh, discusses reinforcement and punishment in observational learning. So from the point of view of learning, do we have reinforcement? Do we have punishment? Remember that punishment and reinforcement were discussed when we were discussing operant conditioning. Operant conditioning. But here we want to look at it from the point of view of observational learning. And this is not new because we've mentioned it in our previous session. We have vicarious reinforcement. So Bandura used the term vicarious reinforcement to mean a situation when someone observes another person being rewarded for a behavior, and this resulting in reinforcement in the observer as well. For instance, if Kofi saw his friend promoted on the job after obtaining, ob obtaining a university degree, Kofi will most likely be motivated to follow his friend's footstep by learning hard to obtain the degree so that he will also be promoted on the job. So vicarious reinforcement. The reinforcement is actually not with the um, person observing initially, but rather it's on another person. And that gets the observer motivated, or reinforced, to want to engage in that behavior. Vicarious punishments. On the other hand, occurs when the observer fails to reproduce the model's behavior as a result of the fact that the model was punished for exhibiting the said behavior. As we observed in the Bobo Dolls experiment, that's the experiment by Bandura, on the, where the children were made to observe aggression and so on. So the children who saw their model being punished became inhibited, and so they did not exhibit said behaviors because they were afraid to be punished. They are afraid to be punished. There is also intrinsic reinforcement and punishment. These are related to an individual's internalized standards of behavior against which he or she measures his or her performance. So if, for instance, you exceed your own standards of reproducing a model's behavior, you experience increased self-esteem. That is, you set yourself a standard you want to uh, which by watching a particular behavior, when you exceed it, you have that increased self-esteem in you, and this is a powerful reinforcement. This will encourage you to learn, to learn more. On the other hand, if you fall short of these standards, you feel guilty, which is a form of punishment. So that having, say, having been said, uh, Hence the second topic, we we'll move on to the third topic, which is more practical ways of using observational learning in our everyday situation. Let's look at it. Topic three, application of observational learning in everyday situations. I mentioned earlier that whatever you learn is important, you apply them out there in the house, in the school, at church, at work, whatever you find yourself, place of worship, and so on. Now, let's take children. Children learn to speak. They learn to eat, play, and learn about 
gender roles through observational learning. For instance, students see and experience, they, they see and experience the roles of men and women in society, resulting in gender typed activities. You will not be surprised to see children trying to learn how to cook and in the course of cooking they want to dress like how they see their parents dressing. If it's a man who cooks, if the woman who cooks, they, the way they dress before cooking, they want to imitate them in that way. This is a way of observing and learning gradually, which becomes part and parcel of their life. And also, we have observational learning situations in which someone who is abused or goes through domestic violence grows up also abusing others because he observes it being done by people who are older than them. And so they also want to go that way because they may think that they are acceptable ways of life. So they grow up doing that, being abusers and engaging in violence, especially where they see that as being rewarded. So what you're saying is that child abusers learn from their parents and they inadvertently teach their children to be abusers. This was uh, one of the ways that we can explain how observational learning can uh, be applied in parenting. So observational learning in parenting, so you just explain about children, the way they speak, the way they eat, the way they play, and the way they are brought up, and a lot of experience that they go through, including child abuse, and domestic violence and so on. Then when you take also the next thing is uh, workplace. We have various forms of observational learning at the workplace. For instance, some form of job training as an apprenticeship, they rely more on observational learning. The seamstresses, the tailors, the carpenters, the mechanics, and so on and so forth. They observe what their masters do. And based on this observation, they are able to correct their mistakes and gradually become perfect in whatever they do. There are others, including medical doctors and surgeons, who, in addition to their various courses in the classrooms, they observe how surgery is being performed. They observe how patients are being handled. And in the course of observation, they learn to also practice. So observational learning is something that is being used in the workplace, during training, and so on and so forth. And several other work situations apply observational learning, the way we dress, the way leadership in organizations engage other workers, and so on and so forth. In the media, observational learning is applied as well. Example is what we looked at with the Bandura's experiment. So there was this question, do children learn to be violent from watching violent TV programs. This caused a lot of research to be conducted. And studies by psychologists confirm that children are great imitators of what they see. The American Psychological Association has observed, after several years of research, that yes, there's no doubt that high levels of viewing violence on television are correlated with increased acceptance of aggressive attitudes and increased aggressive behaviors. So this explains why movie producers are tasked to adopt warning labels for violent, violent shows that they are producing as a way to guide parents especially where they have to monitor their children's behaviors. 
So it's common to see on movies that are produced, labels such as PG, which signifies parental guide, and they show the age limit or the age that one is expected to attain before watching a particular movie, maybe 18 years plus, so 13 years plus, and so on and so forth. All in an effort to get um, parents to control the watching behavior or television watching behavior of their children. And of course, it's not only children, all of us adults, we are in one way or the other influenced by what we observe from outside or even on our televisions so that we don't, um, we, we are influenced. So it just tells us the, 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 the strength of observational learning as a way of uh, acquiring new ways of behavior. And it's important that we uh, do this as a way of preventing the observational learning of undesirable behaviors by children. This and many other benefits that are there through observational learning is what we want us to uh, always look out for and uh, make sure we do the right things. So with this, we've come to the end of this session and we're preparing to look at the next session. Thank you very much.